What do you do if you're ripped off and don't know where to turn? I did outline all the faults in the vehicle. He rejected all those. Court of law backs you, but you still don't get your money. Little did I know how long it would take to try and recover the money from him. Sorry. It's time to call the sheriffs. We have every right to enter the premises by force if necessary. We will be entering that building. Sheriffs are high court enforcement officers who recover what a court judgment says is owed. The writ orders us to come here and seize goods to the value of this debt. They're the experts in getting cash that's rightfully yours. £1,323. But fighting for the underdog isn't a job for the faint-hearted. Come on, self -lodged. I will back that truck straight through your windscreen. Debtors aren't pleased to see them. They're harassing me. Because they hate paying up. Are you happy for me to just leave you some paperwork? No, I'm not. Go away. In today's programme... A builder made 86-year-old Hilda Shaw fork out £4,000 for some work on her roof. And he left it in a worse state than when he started. I was absolutely shattered. I was crying. I couldn't leave off because I realised, well, you know, the mess I was getting into and I couldn't say stop. The sheriffs pay the builder an early morning visit to try and get Hilda's money back. And things get rather heated. I will back that truck straight through your windscreen. The sheriffs tried to track down a landlord who didn't pay his student tenants their deposits when they left. But he proves elusive. I obviously don't want to deal with it over the phone. He's telling me to come to an address that he doesn't seem that sure of. And office manager Joan Wales was unfairly dismissed. She was awarded compensation, but her ex-bosses didn't pay up. Can the sheriffs help? They just thought I'd walk away and I wouldn't fight for this. Um, but I do fight, and I am fighting because it's wrong. Hilda Shaw is an 86-year-old pensioner who lives in Northampton. She needs the help of the sheriffs because some straightforward maintenance work on her roof became an expensive ordeal. The story starts in June 2011, when Hilda spotted a builder working on the guttering of a nearby house. She asked him how much he was charging for the work. He said, uh, 1,200. I thought, well, that don't sound too bad. And uh, he said, we don't take any money or no deposits until the work is done. He said, and you'll be ever so pleased with it. Hilda decided to get her guttering smartened up by the same building business, run by Alan Fitzgerald. Once they got the ladders up on the front of the bungalow, you could hear all the banging and the ripping and heaven knows what. In comes the tall, towering boss of the lot. And he said, uh, it'll be £2,000. And that shook me a bit, comparing with what he'd told me down the road for the other bungalow. And uh, he said, we should need the money for the materials, you see. Hilda paid the builder the £2,000. Then two days later, he called her outside and pointed to the roof. Look, he said, your tiles are all breaking up and they're coming down and your roof's going to be in a mess, he said. Well, I said, oh, that's dangerous. And uh, he said he'd want, you know, put him right. Otherwise, you know, it's all going to come tumbling down. And uh, he said that'll be another 2,000, he said, for doing that. And I thought, my God, what am I going to do? Hilda was worried one of her tiles might fall off the roof and hurt someone. She rushed off to the bank and withdrew some of her life savings. I handed over this money and I thought to myself, I didn't see myself, you know, I thought, what are you doing, woman? One of her neighbours alerted Hilda's son, Terry, about what was going on. He phoned his mother from Lincoln, where he was working. And my son was shouting, get that man out of off the property, get him off. You know, and he was yelling there, 
and uh, he said don't let him get on that roof and I was absolutely shattered I was crying I couldn't leave off because I realized what well, you know the mess I was getting into and I couldn't say stop Hilda told the builders to leave and then asked her neighbor Dawn to help she got in touch with trading standards and I thought, thank the Lord, I've got somebody to stand up for, because I'm going to start, you know, it's reacting on me terrible, because I went through a terrible state. And uh, Dawn said, if they show up on the Friday, she said, just phone the police. And she was wonderful. I don't know what I would have done without her. I really don't. Hilda's son, Terry, had travelled from Lincoln to take a look at what the builders had done. He was shocked by what he saw. Well, it's ridiculous. If Mum paid over the top for a job, and it was correct, OK, you paid over the top, but when the job's not correct, it's, what can you say? They told my mother that the felt had gone underneath the roof, had rotted away, which I knew hadn't rotted away, because I've got bits and pieces in the roof. It's not damp at all, no problem at all with it. And there was the guttering, it had been folded over, you know, it hadn't been fitted right. You know, my son poured water into the guttering. It was running the opposite direction, you know, you put a spirit level on it and it ran the opposite way. You can't get the guttering wrong, you know, it's no good saying, I'll come back and put the guttering right. You shouldn't get it wrong in the first place. He said, my God, they call themselves builders. He said, it's shocking. My mother's very vulnerable at that age and she's not normally like that, she's normally very alert very clued up and feel very safe for her there, but in the situation what happened, I'm worrying all the time now. Hilda got a county court judgment and a high court writ for the money, but the builder still didn't pay her a penny. With nowhere else to turn, she called the high court enforcement officers. She hopes they can get her money back. It'll be clearing something in my mind and my brain to think somebody around is there to help us, you know, because there's a lot of elderly that never know where to go, have got no one to stick up for them. You know, oh God. It's 7 a.m. and Sheriffs Mark Newton and Kev McNally are on their way to where the builder lives. If he's home, He'll be faced with a bill for Hilda's money, court costs and interest. Um, he owes £6,600, so um, it's coming up to 7 o'clock, so hopefully he's still around. And we'll give him a, a knock and see if we can either get him out of bed or get him to pay some money. We'll see some of his goods, we'll see how we get on. Mark and Kev have arrived at the builder's house. They've made an early start to increase the chances of him being in. Sheriffs can legally climb through open windows, but Mark opts for a different approach. Hello? Well, they're going to be the dogs, aren't they? Pardon? Garage door. Garage door, right. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Fitzgerald? Yeah. Um, that a high court writ that's been issued against you by uh, Miss Hilda Shaw? Hilda Shaw. Yeah. Regarding. Um, do you want to come in for a minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just closed this garage down. They might bark, yeah. yeah, that's right. High court enforcement officers usually don't know the background story to the writ, so they can't answer the builder's first question. Which particular job is this customer complaining about? That's regarding Hilda Shaw. It's to do... Well, I don't know what... It's conservatory. It could be. I'll, I'll just get given... I son yesterday. Yeah. The job's finished. Yeah. Um, but she took you to the county court, yeah? With regards to it, back in October, no payment's been made and they've sent us out here today. October? Yeah. We've only just finished the job two days ago. Um, you got an address? No. How much is it for? £6,636. £6,000? Hmm. 
Yeah. You sure it's me? Yeah, Alan Fitzgerald, A to Z Builders. At this point, our cameraman was asked to leave the property. Mark tells Alan Fitzgerald that if necessary, he'll remove his equipment and auction it to pay Hilda's debt. The negotiations continue for over an hour. After a tough discussion, Mark and Kev leave the house. Cheers, bye bye. He paid £800 today. He said he's going to go to the court this afternoon or this morning to get it sorted. He says it's nothing to do with him. Um, he thinks he's some lads he had working for him, so we'll just go from there and see what happens, really. Mark and Kev head back to base, and it looks like they're leaving just in time. Some of the builders' labourers have arrived. They clearly take a dim view of today's early morning visit to their boss. Pardon? No, yeah. I will back that truck straight through your windscreen. No worries, all right. Just all right. go away, yeah? Right, we'll go in now, Joe. Let's go. Come in the family man's way. Nice people. Mark and Kev might not have got any money for Hilda if the labourers had arrived during the negotiations. It was a bit of a blessedly disguise that they turned up after he's paid us, to be honest. Um, I think that could have taken a different turn. Yeah. If they'd have been there half hour earlier. And I, I think he's the kind of guy you, you, you don't want to go... You know, obviously, we treat everyone with a bit of respect, but you don't want to go in and rub him up the wrong way. Yeah, it's dealt with now. Hopefully, he'll go to the court, get it sorted one way or the other, and if he has to pay, he'll pay. So Hilda will get the first instalment of the money she is due. And if the court rules against the builder's appeal, and he doesn't pay the rest, the sheriffs will be back. We asked Alan Fitzgerald to comment. He disputes the allegations, and we will return to this story later in the series. This High Court Enforcement Office is based near London. If it's a commercial property, then we can force entry to levy if necessary. Over 70,000 High Court writs a year are executed by Britain's enforcement officers, who've been known as sheriffs since Saxon times. The amount outstanding at the moment is £5,521.61. How would you like to pay? People owed money are increasingly turning to High Court enforcement officers because they have a better success rate than county court bailiffs. You don't get seven days, you don't get any time. We're here with a live writ. A High Court writ costs £60. If the sheriffs are successful, there's nothing more to pay. If not, there's an admin fee, also £60. <laughs> Sheriff Mark's next job is in Essex. He and colleague Simon Castle are visiting a landlord called Syed Raza, who didn't give his tenants their deposits back when they moved out. It looks like it's going to be a, a residential address um, and there's a time at 2 o'clock. Hopefully we'll get someone in, but if we don't, we'll, uh, we'll try and see some goods there today, pop the paperwork through the door and hopefully get called, but we, we won't know until we get there for sure. Three students went to the county court after their rent deposits weren't returned. They got judgment in their favour, but the money still wasn't paid so the claim was transferred up to the High Court. Now the sheriffs are enforcing a writ for the owed money, plus interest and costs. Uh, the amount owed on this is £11,100. So it's, it's not a tiny little debt, it's, uh, it's a reasonable amount. Um, whether they're going to have that if they're in, or we'll have to wait and see that on that, because we don't even know what the house is like at the moment, what kind of area we're going into. But we will find out soon. The sheriffs arrive at what looks like an expensive house. And the cars on the drive aren't cheap either. Hi, uh, not the Said Raza. Said Raza's not him. No. Oh, You're not him, no? I'm not him. No. 
The only way of getting hold of him at all. What's this regarding? Uh, it's from the High Court. Yeah, Sheriff's no, I could see that. Yeah. It's about some outstanding money that's owed to Emma Shanks. Sorry, who? Emma Shanks, Fran Muirhead and Megan Nielsen. Oh, is this about the flat? Could be. I don't know, unfortunately. I'll just okay, get the two yeah, yeah, I know, I know which one you're talking about. And he's not here. All right. Yeah? You got any way of getting hold of him because we're to seize goods today. Seize to goods today? Yeah. But he doesn't live here anymore. All right, where does he live now then? He's moved out. Mayors now. The personalised number plate on the car is a clue that perhaps Syed Raza might still live here. But it isn't proof. There may be more than one Syed in the family. I can give you his number and you can talk to him yourself. Right, no problem. Okay. Okay. Well, I just need to see some proof that he's not at this address if possible, so like a council tax bill or something like that. I'll bring you. Yeah. Mark's tempted to clamp and remove the car with the Syed plate to pay off the debt. But he needs to be sure the car is owned by the landlord, Syed Raza, and not somebody else also called Syed. Can we clamp up that car? Oh, well, it's got a name on it. Mm, well, we can't go by what's written on the number plate, but you don't drive around with a car that's Syed no. if your name's not Syed. I mean, is there two brothers with different middle names? And they're not called both Syed, are they? Well, it's they Karen. could be. Could be a dad and a son, yeah. couldn't it? Mark asked the office to do background checks to see if there's more than one Syed in the family. Do we have to see who's living at the address on like electoral register or something? I have a utility bill, but that's not a quite old one. But there's a bank statement which is quite fairly new. While Simon checks the paperwork to clarify who lives in the house, Mark finds out how many Syeds there are in the family. Or there's two. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank bye. you. All right, bye. Sorry. All right. Yeah, there is two. Oh, is well. no, okay. yeah. Taking the car is too risky. There's a 50-50 chance it doesn't belong to the Syed they're after. Mark gets the phone number of the landlord Syed from his younger brother. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a try. Hello, is that Syed Raza? It's Mark Newton from the Sheriff's Office. Yeah, I just spoke to your brother, I believe he's your brother, and he's given me a number. Yeah, it's about um, a High Court writ that's been issued against you. Um, well, basically we're looking at collecting payment today. You work in the city? All right, what's your address in the city? Okay. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. I obviously don't want to deal with it over the phone. He's telling me to come to an address that he doesn't seem that sure of. No. Because <laughs> he's making it up as he goes on Gravesend Road in WC1. Gravesend Road doesn't sound like it'd be in WC1, but it could be. Simon does some checks on the address and it's bad news. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Well, nothing, nothing comes up on it. Mark was dubious about the address as soon as he heard it. Yeah, it's at Gravesend He's going, it's at 200. And then he went 37. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, let's just make it up as I go along. Mark posts the writ and works out an action plan. We'll check the cars and see who they come back as registered to. We'll try and sort of get some details back to our office and see if we can look into it a bit more. If any of the cars are registered to Syed the landlord, the sheriffs will be back. But for now, they must bide their time. Disappointing result, but that's the nature of our game, unfortunately. We have to pursue people, and when we're out like we are today, just doing first visits on people, you, you don't always get the result, but you come back armed with a bit more information the second time, and you can get the result the second time now. If Mark does return, he'll bring his wheel clamp with him. This case isn't over yet. Joan Wales worked for a company which specialises in hardwood floors for 12 years. Joan had a senior role within the business, classical flooring in Suffolk. I was in charge of the showroom. Um, the bosses, if they went on holiday, I was in, in charge of the company. I thought it was a good job. Despite being senior, Joan didn't mind helping out the sales staff when things got hectic. 
advising customers which floors to buy. When it was really, really busy and there was lots going on, I mean, I thrived on it, loved it. Yeah, so I really liked it. Jones thought she got on well with the company owners. I don't think you can work with somebody for 12 years and not have a bond. I mean, I actually thought they were my friends. I, I did. I thought they were my friends. I'm, I mean, I know we'd had our ups and downs and everything else, as, as, any, as friends do, um, but I never thought um, for a minute that they'd do what they did. No, I'd never, never. Things started to go wrong when Joan's bosses told her they wanted to reduce her hours by 50%. I, I didn't want to drop my hours because I couldn't afford to. I would have definitely lost my home because I wouldn't have been able to pay my bills. Having been at the company for well over a decade, Joan felt she deserved better treatment. I was working with another lady as well, um, and they didn't want to change her hours, they just wanted to change mine. And as I'd been there 12 years, and she, she hadn't, um, I didn't think it was right. You know, I, I actually thought, um, if it was a bit of everybody, you know, sort of partaking in it, that, you know, that would be fine, but I didn't want it to be just me. Joan contacted the Citizens Advice Bureau, who suggested she write a letter to her bosses explaining why her hours shouldn't be reduced. The letter didn't go down well. They called me up to the office. It was said that they couldn't afford to keep me any longer. They were going to pay me to the end of the week, and obviously they didn't expect me to attend, that I was free to go. Um, and that would be it. And um, I said, that's, that's, that's not right. That's not, you know, I said, you can't do that. It's, it's illegal. Joan was in a state of shock, but she still turned up for work the next day. There was a letter on my desk saying um, basically that after 12 years of um, service with them, uh, you know, due to the financial um, situation of the company, they, they couldn't afford to keep me any longer. And that was um, goodbye. Joan couldn't believe what she was hearing from people she'd regarded as friends, as well as colleagues. It's very hard. Um, I didn't think they'd do it to me. Joan took the company owners to an employment tribunal. I decided that I would fight. And, um, we, you know, when we, when we took it to court, it was very stressful, all of it, really, because you're having to fight for something that you shouldn't really have to fight for. But Joan won her fight. The tribunal verdict was unfair dismissal, and she was awarded nearly £13,500. But her ex-bosses didn't pay up. Classical flooring were supposed to give me my money by a certain time, which obviously they haven't. Um, I don't think they'd willingly give me anything, anything at all, because to them, they, you know, they think I, I think they just thought I'd walk away and I wouldn't fight for this. Um, but I do fight and I am fighting because it's, it's, it's wrong. But there was only so much fighting Joan could do on her own. So she enlisted the help of the High Court Enforcement Office. They dispatched two sheriffs to enforce the writ. Kev McNally and Lawrence Grix are going to see Joan's former bosses and hopefully get her £13,500 plus interest and their costs. The debt we're looking for is just over £15,500 um, at the moment. So we're, we're now in business hours, it's half past ten, so the company should be open and trading, so hopefully we'll just be able to walk in um, because it'll be open. Hopefully the gentleman will be there and we'll be able to sort it out. But if necessary, Lawrence could force entry to remove goods to settle the debt because it's a commercial premises. It's a floor. Classical floor and joinery. Is that them? Yeah. Usually the threat of removing goods is sufficient to get a debtor company to pay up. Hello? Stairs moving. The sheriffs don't give advance warning of a visit. 
it reduces the likelihood of goods belonging to the debtor company disappearing before they arrive. And it normally increases the chances of finding the owners, but not always. We've gone. Hello there. I'm looking for Mr. Barnard or Mr. Lidford. Uh, I call him Falsman, officer. Hello, sir. One of Jones' ex-bosses, Mr. Barnard, is present. He's willing to talk to Lawrence, but our camera operator is asked to leave the building. Lawrence's negotiations on behalf of Joan continue for over an hour. The classical flooring boss informs Lawrence that all the assets have been transferred to another company and he has paperwork to prove it. Lawrence leaves empty-handed, but the story is far from over. I'm quite happy with the paperwork that I've seen, that none of the major assets in there, none of the equipment, the tools or anything like that actually belong to the two gentlemen personally. Um, so. There's nothing really at that premises we can actually remove. I have seized all the, all the raw materials and hardwood flooring, um, and they're going to provide proof, which no doubt they will be able to, that the limited company own that as well. But I did warn the gentleman that we can go to their private addresses. It is against them personally. So all their personal assets are likely to be seized and removed if necessary to cover the debt. Sometimes it can take several visits for the sheriffs to get the money their clients owed. But persistence often pays. We won't be giving up yet just because we can't get any assets from the company. I think we are going to end up going to the home addresses. But I did make um, notes of one of the vehicles that they appear to turn up in, um, which is a, a 60 registered van, which will have quite a significant value to it. So if it is registered to one of them personally and it's clear on finance, we'll be straight round to whoever's residence it is and we'll have the van away and sell it at auction before they know what's happening. The sheriffs may soon be visiting Joan's former bosses at home, but for the time being, she will have to wait for her money. High Court Enforcement Officer Pete Spencer is on his way to enforce a writ for a company debt. A small company won a county court judgment against a business which it felt owed it money. Promotional and novelty mug designers Monster Mugs Limited. The total Pete wants from the Monster Mugs director today is £2,775. But he may be prepared to accept a down payment as it's his first visit. Hi, good morning. The reason for our visit, as I explained to you, yeah. enforcement officer. Right. I've got an I caught rate that I'm enforcing here today. What, sorry? An I caught rate that I'm enforcing today. What's that? It's an I caught rate. What What's happened is the the claimant has moved it from county court up to I caught right. for enforcement purposes. Yeah, the reason for our visit is to enforce the outstanding debt. So it's either to collect two seven seven five fifty six. Are you alright with the check for it? No, we can't take it. It's got to be cleared funds. So. Credit card, debit card, or oh, cash. It'll have, right. have to be a check. Bank transfer. I can't do it. We, we can take an initial payment today, right. not of the full amount, and then you can email in um, what could you pay today, because I'll have to run it by our office. Very, very little. Right. Unlike a commercial premises, Pete can't force his way into a company director's home to seize goods on a first visit. He will have to accept a lower figure today and then come back for the rest, if he needs to. So if I did say a couple hundred today? You're right, OK. Because if that's the only payment you can pay me today, right. we can take the £200 and then you must email into our office that's with fair. an arrangement to pay monthly the outstanding debt. Right. Um, the, claim, the claimant can decline that monthly offer right. and can demand it in full. And then what happens then? We'd re-attend to remove goods. Or, or would you just come back and see us again? We'd come back again, yeah. Right, so you're happy with 200 today? We can take 200 today if that's all you can, right. can manage. Are you right there? Is yeah, it's fine. The sheriff's first visit often works as a warning shot. Debtors tend to pay the rest of what they owe before a second visit to remove goods becomes necessary. What's your pin if you can just press the OK button? If I can just ask you to sign the receipt. OK. Cheers, thank you. Thanks. Before he leaves, Pete lists property he could remove to clear the debt if he does have to come back. 
we've levied the vehicle on the driveway, which uh, he, he possibly won't be aware of, but it's on the paperwork we've given him as well that we've levied all the items within the vehicle. Pete and his colleagues have one of the highest debt collection rates in the industry. They don't give up easily. The director of Monster Mugs is disputing the county court judgment against him and his company. He claims proper processes weren't followed by the other company's solicitor, which meant he and Monster Mugs weren't made aware of any legal action being taken against them. He says for that reason, he and Monster Mugs weren't in court to defend themselves. He's seeking further action to have the case set aside and is hoping all the money he's paid out so far will be returned. It's 7am and High Court Enforcement Officers Mark and Kev are on their way back to Essex. They're revisiting the landlord who didn't give his tenants their deposits back when they left. The house is on this road, is it? But the car was here as well. Yeah, it's right at the end of this road. It was a good move by Mark to take down the number plates of the cars in the drive on his first visit. It's led to a crucial breakthrough in the sheriff's mission to get the tenants their money. And one of the vehicles has come back as, as registered to the gentleman we're after. It's the vehicle in front of us at the moment, so I think what we'll do is we'll throw a clamp on this and then we'll go and knock the door, to be honest, because we're just going to get told he's not here or he doesn't live here and expect us to go away, but this time we'll throw a clamp on the car and see whether we can get some sort of payment out of him. The debt comes to £11,799. That's the unpaid deposits plus court costs and interest. Mark needs to clamp the car quickly before the owner sees what's going on and tries to stop him. It's going to be tight. It's going to be tight on this. Yeah. To see if they get in and try and drive out for the go. I'll just drive over. If the owner comes out now, he could simply drive the car away and Mark and Kev could do nothing to stop him. Any big wheels. Mark has secured the clamp. The car is totally immobilised. Oh. Oh. They're arse now. <laughs> it's like the biggest wheel in history. <laughs> Time to see if the car's owner, landlord Syed Raza, is at home. Hi, hey, mate. Uh, Master Syed Hassan Raza. He's not mm. here. We're we going to. Um, some money that's outstanding to Emma Shanks, Land Muirhead, and Megan Nelson. First of all, he doesn't live here anymore, so... All right. Did I speak to you before? No, you yeah, haven't spoken. No. Have you got any way of getting hold of him at all? Uh, Is he a relation? Or? No, I can get you... OK, just one minute. Yeah, no problem. If the door had been left open, the sheriffs could have walked straight in and removed any other property belonging to Syed Raza. The three students owed their deposit money are from New Zealand. One has already gone home, but she still wants her money back. I'll give you his number, I'm not going to Do you want to give him a call for us? Is he... Has no, he... he's not around, he's gone abroad, so... Has he? Yeah. He's got no way of getting hold of him at all? Uh, I don't know, he's going to be probably back end of the month. End of the month, all right. Did you put that time on? Yeah. Why? Because we're going to take it away unless we can get some money. But that doesn't belong to him, does it? Yeah. No, it doesn't belong to him. Who does it belong to? Then? That's belong to my brother. On and his is it on his name? Yeah, his name is? See, it's Glenn Raza. And it's registered to Saeed Hassan Raza. How much is that outstanding, sir? £11,799. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. The clamp on the car as well, they said, you know, is that 11,000 standing or... You can't put clamp on my car, it just it belongs to a company car. And I'm using that car. Well, have you got some... Have you got the yeah, lock for that? Because he doesn't live here anymore, so, you know, if there's something to do with it, you should get hold of him. Well, I spoke to him before, he gave me an address that wasn't an address. He'd given you address and yeah. it wasn't that address. Uh, no, that address was just a made-up address that he made up. 
The landlord's brother phones him to tell him his car has been clamped. Amazing, isn't it? He couldn't get hold of him, did it? Right? And now he's getting hold of him. Yeah. How much is the amount? 11,000 something? 11,799 pounds. 11,799. The sheriffs could try the door handle. And if it isn't locked, walk straight into the house to see if any other goods could be seized. I'm going in a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm going in a minute. I've got a feeling this is the parents' address. Yeah. But, yeah. You can do. But the very visible clamp on the car might prove to be enough of an incentive for the family to pay up, whether the landlord's here or not. It's hanging on there. It's through the suspension, it's all right. It ain't going nowhere. Natural disaster. I spoke to him. He goes, he's coming back on 19. He goes, till 19. Because obviously, at the end of the day, we can't do anything. Okay, well, no, we're going to be taking the car then. Not leaving us any option here. The, Wait, is there the, any minimum payment we can do? No, nah, it needs to be the full amount. We can't clear 11,000 units and we wouldn't have that much. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with one card, you know, we can take it off. A few cards, whatever, however you want to spread that out. The landlord's brother invites the sheriffs in. Mark checks the house to see if there are any items relating to the business that could be removed. Be another room with everything in. Mm. No, in there. Somebody come out of their bedroom in a minute and go, what the f <laughs> <laughs> At this point, our cameraman was asked to leave the house. The family offers to pay £5,000, but that is less than half of what is owed. Because this is a second visit, Mark decides to up the ante. He asks the office to find out the value of the clamped car. If you could just find out what it is worth. Because I'm getting offered 5,000. Um, but obviously, we've got a bit more now standing. So, if the vehicle's worth like 10 or 11, then we might as well go with the vehicle. If it's worth four, then obviously we'll go with taking the five grand. Um. But Mark might not have any choice. It looks like the family has made its mind up not to hand over any cash today. It's not a good sign they're emptying out the car. When Mark goes back into the house, the landlord's brother tells him to take the car. But the sheriffs prefer hard cash, so they try a different tactic. If you can come back to us with something, try and get a little bit more, because we've got an idea of what could happen if you give it all, maybe, you think? Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, it's definitely not in your brother's interest for us to take the car, because his costs are going to go up by... Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what the figures are going to be. Well, it's going to be it's going to be like another about four or five hundred pound on the bill, um, which is still going to be liable for you know. If the truck's coming back at, at value at just under nine thousand pounds. The new approach does the trick. The family doesn't want to lose a nine thousand pound car. Mark comes out to get the chip and pin machine. We're trying to just get a little bit more from them, uh, so I feel they can pay more. Um, they offered five, we got one of the brothers to say six, but they just said, have you got a card machine? And it sounds, we can't quite get them just to the conversation, but it sounds like they want to pay maybe all of it. So just going to take the card machine in and see where we go. It could be £5,000 to 11800 in one fell swoop. That would be quite a result. Always in a lot. It's the full amount, yeah? The landlord's brother pays the total amount by debit card, which adds £5 to the total making it a round £11,804. Sure, pop me. I uh, just want to sign this to say pay £11,804 on debit card balances, Neil. Just sign there and print there for us. The three students from New Zealand will get their deposits back in full. All right, Thank you lovely. Much. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. Mark and his colleagues successfully retrieve over £2 million a month. They can now add £11,800 to that total. All they need to do is unclamp the car and they can be on their way. To be honest, I wasn't expecting to get the full payment, but I think they realised that if they made half payment, we'd still have the vehicle and then we can come back and remove it and 
think the older brother made the decision in the yeah. end of me. I think Paul Panton was a result for him. Yeah. yeah, happy with it. Mark and Kev return to base, and soon the three students from New Zealand will be getting some good news. It's now a month since Lawrence and Kev went to Classical Flooring Limited and former office manager Joan Whale still hasn't been paid what she's owed. The sheriffs have now run background checks and traced the owner's home addresses. Soon, they will go to their houses with a view to seizing goods and vehicles to pay off the debt. The three students who didn't get their deposits back from landlord Syed Raza now have their cash. They realise that without the help of the sheriffs, they wouldn't have got a penny. And on Christmas Eve, Hilda Shaw received the cheque for £400 from the builder, who charged over £4,000 for the work on her roof. He's offered to make payments of £200 per week to pay off the rest of the debt. I could never have done it on my own, there's no doubt about that. It made me feel there was hope. Where I'd felt so down is if I wasn't going to see any of my money anymore. Hilda thinks she made the right decision, enlisting the help of the High Court enforcement officers. I really am pleased with what can be done to folks like him. But if the builder doesn't keep up the payments, the sheriffs will be back. Next time. David Hart bought a beach buggy to enjoy with his son. But he found out it was stolen. Yeah, there's my dream, on the back of a low loader, going up the road. When the sheriffs go to get David's money back from the man who sold it to him, things turn nasty. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm here doing a job, aren't I? Right off your shoulder. I'm here doing a job, aren't I? The sheriffs brave a torrential rainstorm as they visit a pub on behalf of a former employee who'd been unfairly dismissed. Yeah, we're looking to collect some money. You're not having this jumper. And a customer wants his money back from an art gallery who didn't give him the print he'd paid for. But before the sheriffs can get his cash, they need to get in. He's in. Showing its teeth tonight on BBC One Wales Watchdog at 8, including a look at why Brits pay more for some products than customers in other parts of Europe. Next this morning, cash in the attic for life-changing eye surgery. If you're ripped off and don't know where to turn, I did outline all the faults in the vehicle. He rejected all those. A court of law backs you, but you still don't get your money. Little did I know how long it would take to try and recover the money from him. Sorry. It's time to call the sheriffs. We have every right to enter the premises by force if necessary. We will be entering that building. Sheriffs are high court enforcement officers who recover what a court judgment says is owed. The writ orders us to come here and seize goods to the value of this debt. They're the experts in getting cash that's rightfully yours. £1,323. But fighting for the underdog isn't a job for the faint-hearted. Come on, self -lock. I will back that truck straight through your whiskey. Debtors aren't pleased to see them. They're harassing me. Because they hate paying up. Are you happy for me to just leave you some paperwork? No, I'm not. Go away. In today's programme... If you did three months' work, you'd expect to get paid for it. But in Yasmin Shatur's case, 12 weeks' work at a pharmacy earned her nothing. I'm just a small fry. I mean, but I have earned this money. Lawrence takes on a lawyer in pursuit of Yasmin's cash. I'm asking you for the third no, time just, on front of TV, what's your boss's name? Just phone the office. What's his name? Just phone the office. The sheriffs get given the cold shoulder when they chase up a debt in Derbyshire. Mrs. Brassington, we're putting your phone through the cat flap. 
and the sheriffs are back on the trail of the builder who took an 86 year old for over 4,000 pounds of shoddy and unnecessary roofing work. Don't let him escape. Get him by the tail or anything. Hopefully there won't be no trouble. And if we need the police, we'll give them a call. A couple needing the sheriff's help are Yasmin Shatur and her husband Al Nasir. A professional pharmacist, Yasmin was working at a local chemist in northwest London when she decided she wanted to leave and become self employed. The company owner, Bijal Patel, convinced her to stay on for an extra month as he was winding up the business anyway. Mother of two, Yasmin, agreed as a favour. In the end, she stayed on for three extra months. But when she invoiced for payment, she got nothing, no matter how hard she chased. He would never answer the phone. Whenever I used to phone the office, um, the manager would uh, always give me an excuse. Either he's out of town, or he will pass on the message, or he's not in the office. With her phone calls getting nowhere, Yasmin tried writing to Mr Patel but her letters were also ignored. Yasmin wasn't prepared to give up on the money she was owed. I felt very strongly because I provided services and I have worked for it. And that is how I felt about it. An individual should not be able to get away with something like this. I mean, I'm just, to put it very simply, a small fry. I mean, but I have earned this money. I have worked for it. So I, I, I genuinely felt that this is not fair. Yasmin took Green Oaks Pharmacy to the small claims court. It took two years to come to court, but when it finally did, Green Oaks didn't attend. The court awarded Yasmin £5,874, which she feels goes some way to vindicating the strain involved in pursuing her case. If you count the, the effort, the paperwork, the stress, the interest, Over including two years. everything, it wouldn't justify that amount. But I think we would feel justified in having seen it through and I suppose feeling that we did the right thing. But since the judgment's been made, Yasmin still not received the money she's owed. So she and Al Nasir have been forced to turn to the sheriffs. I mean, more than the amount, I think I would be overjoyed to get the, uh, what do you call it, justice. Mm. Tasked with getting Yasmin back her money are Sheriffs Kev McNally and Lawrence Griggs. We're on our way to Pinner at the moment, um, to Green Oaks Pharmacy Limited, and we're, we're looking for £8,258 and two pence. The sheriffs park up near the pharmacy and head in. But there's a problem. I'm taking neither of you are the owner or the director of, uh, of Pharmacare Limited. It's soon apparent the business is now run by different people. All right, thanks very much for your help. The company we're looking for is no longer there. The people behind there don't match the description we've got of the debtor, um, the, you know, who's the director of the, uh, the debtor company. So we'll go to the, uh, the office address now that we've got. So it's back to the van. The Green Oaks Pharmacy main office is only a few miles away. As they arrive, Lawrence spots something that could be crucial. A Range Rover Sport with the same registration number as one owned by Bijal Patel. It's in there, isn't it? If it belongs to Green Oaks, the sheriffs could remove and auction it to pay off the debt to Yasmin. Lawrence notes the Range Rover's details and then heads in, writ in hand. Oh, there you go. We're looking for Green Oaks Pharmacy Limited. You've got a Mr. B. Jack Patel in any of the companies. I believe it's his Range Rover out the back. A bemused secretary can't help Lawrence. She says there's no Green Oaks Pharmacy operating from this address. But Lawrence doesn't give up that easily. He's convinced Bijal Patel has businesses and potentially assets in the building. 
he makes a call to the office to find out more information on the company. What's the status of Green Oaks? Kev goes out to clamp the Range Rover. If the sheriffs can't get payment today, Lawrence will be looking for a walking possession order on the car. It means the Range Rover is seized, but not removed. The owner has five days to contest it. If not, the sheriffs can tow it away to be sold at auction to pay back Yasmin. Seeing a, a clamp on the car might bring uh, the owner down in a hurry. So we might then make contact, and at least then we can ascertain one way or the other whether it belongs to our debtor company. But Kev's got a problem. Hi, oh, Kev. Yeah, mate, this clamp doesn't fit anywhere near, mate. No, I knew it wouldn't. <laughs> no, I, did, I did warn you. Oh, I'm out of way out here anyway. There's nothing else for it. Kev's going to have to stay outside to keep an eye on the car so it's not driven away. And time's ticking on. The judgment amount when we came here was £8,258.02. pence. It's now more than that because we've done a HPI check and we've been here for over an hour. Um, but a £20,000 vehicle sold at auction would, would more than cover that. With two sheriffs on site and Lawrence making reception his own, it's not long before Green Oaks Pharmacy Limited finally shows an interest. The company lawyer gives Lawrence a call. In particular, he's concerned about Lawrence's designs on the Range Rover. I'm trying at the moment to establish ownership of the vehicle. I've got it seized at the moment, and I'm trying to ascertain ownership of the vehicle. With the phone call going nowhere, the lawyer decides to come down in person for a face-to-face -face with Lawrence. Looking for me? Oh, I spoke earlier on. Who are you, sir? Job and Putra. The solicitor? Yes. Yeah, I'll show you some identification, sir. The solicitor says Green Oaks Pharmacy isn't at this address. So nor should Lawrence be. Now you've come here, and I think if you look at the company accounts, you'll see that this is not the registered address. It's up to you well, and the company. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got the company accounts, have I? Well, I suggest you do. Your company, obviously, presumably they are amicable, they, are, they, are, they know what they're doing. They should do yeah. a company search and find out where the registered address What's is. What's that got to do with the company accounts? Because obviously you need to go to we, the we, place no, where we the go, company is based. We can go to any... Any address in England and Wales where we sure. believe the defendant has assets? Well, there's no assets here, as far as I know. There's a company here. I think this is harassment from you. Not it's not right. Sir. It is, because what you told me in the phone is that you can take any, seize any car. Is I, that not what you told me? I did. I can, so you can I seize can, any car, anybody? I can seize any vehicle yes. if I believe it may belong to the debtor right. in How order to you? ascertain yeah. ownership of the vehicle. Fine. How do you know any car out there belongs to them? Because that is the, the details of that vehicle, the registration number, yeah. I have been given by our claimant. And yeah. she's given us that as the registration number of, of the director right. of the company. So seen, I have seized the vehicle to ascertain ownership. If it's owned by the director personally, then obviously I can't it take it. It is, doesn't belong to the well, I need, anybody in the company. Right, well, whoever owns that vehicle... Sure. Because it's, as you can appreciate, it's a vehicle, so it's in jeopardy. It's movable. Within two minutes of me turning my back from here, Fine, if I did a walking possession on it, uh, I would be, would be I driven know, away. I need whoever yes, owns that vehicle to prove ownership yes. of it. How much time are you giving us? Well, not very long at all. I've been here for nearly two hours now. Yes. I've been here for nearly two hours. Nobody actually from the company has had the courtesy to get in touch, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure they know we're here. Okay, all they've done is sent you round to try and fob me off for seven days. No, we're not fogging you off. All we're saying to you is that this is a judgment on which they know nothing about. The solicitor says the company's not aware of the court order against it, and he warns the High Court enforcement officers to keep away from the Range Rover, which he says is not a company asset. But Lawrence wants to see proof of ownership. You can't just stand up and say, I want it now. I can. This is harassment. I can. No, I'm it sorry, isn't. no, it isn't harassment. If this is BBC, I tell you, this is total harassment from this company. You better take, you know, the, the chap's name as well, because this is total they, harassment they know from my them. Name very well. Well, this is... The solicitor asked to speak to Lawrence's boss. You've got, the, you've, got the, you've got the numbers on there. What's your boss's name? You've got the numbers on no, there. No, no, I know. I've got the number. I'm asking you for the third right. time well, in front of TV. What's your boss's name? Just phone the office. What's his name? Just phone the office and ask, for, ask for one of the directors. Right. All right, I'll do that now because I think, you know, I'll get more sense out of them. While he does that, 
Lawrence gets busy too. I'm doing an additional expenses form for the uh, the cost of the HBI check I did and the uh, and the waiting time. He decides to call in the ultimate sanction to see if it'll speed things along. Can you order me a truck, please? And yeah, he's got his. Yeah, it's got to take. It's got to take a Range Rover Sport, so it's going to need a full lift. They won't be able to tow it. Like just lift it. it it'll need. Um, it'll need high abbing onto the back of a truck because it's it's permanent permanent four wheel drive, isn't it? It turns out both men are on the phone to Lawrence's office, but for very different reasons. All right, lovely. Lawrence has prepared the paper seizure of the Range Rover. There you go. It means it can't be disposed of until the ownership issue is resolved. If you sign that now, I'll, I'll cancel the tow truck, because I've ordered a, a tow, tow truck now. So if you're signing that, then I'll cancel the tow truck. Yeah, that's fine then. Lawrence has won his battle. The solicitor signs the seizure documents. All right, so can you um, ask Cathy to cancel the tow truck, please? It's taken three hours, but it's another mission accomplished for Lawrence. Thank you. Sorry to be a pain. <laughs> the car is his, on paper at least, and he won't leave it there. The sheriffs will continue to chase Green Oak's assets until Yasmin's paid back in full. David Carter is Joint Managing Director of this High Court Enforcement Office in London. The recovery rates of the High Court Enforcement Office are far greater than that of a county court bailiff. Part of the reason is that we're paid on results, uh, we're not salaried, um, and the second reason is that we have greater powers than the county court bailiff in terms of seizure and forcing entry to, to various types of premises. Forty full-time enforcement officers work here. They aim to enforce writs within 24 hours of the case being assigned. You can't actually stop me. Uh, I can't stop you. You can't. Lawrence and his colleagues successfully retrieve over £2 million a month for people owed money. Over 70,000 High Court writs a year are executed by Britain's enforcement officers, who've been known as sheriffs since Saxon times. Well, I have a High Court writ. OK, which, it, which orders me what? to come here and seize goods to right. the value of this debt. £6,300. A High Court writ costs £60. If the sheriffs are successful, there's nothing more for the client to pay. All the costs are paid by the debtors. And if they don't manage to get money back for their client, there's only an admin fee, also of £60. But will Lawrence and Kev retrieve the funds owed to the next person needing their special kind of assistance? Graham Millward. Come on, come on, let's go. Come on. Good luck. Graham's had to call in the help of the sheriffs after he ran into problems buying a second-hand car. With a daughter and two young grandchildren, he wanted to treat them to a holiday in Devon. But to drive them there, he needed to upgrade his wheels. Most grandparents would say that it's a, the most important thing in their life, really, when, when grandchildren come along. The idea was to, to get a, a, a people carrier so that we could all holiday together. Graham went looking for a suitable vehicle at local dealerships, but any that fitted the bill were just too dear. Somebody suggested to us, uh, why don't we look at eBay? So we, we thought, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. It wasn't long before he found a car he liked, being sold by a private trader, Jonathan Brassington in Derbyshire. It may have been over two hours' drive away, but the seller had good feedback, and more importantly, the car, a Kia Sedona, was bang within budget. Exactly what we wanted. It looked as though it was a good car, good condition, had plenty of space, had a lot of features that we've been looking for, a lot of features that other people carriers don't have, and uh, it just seemed just the just superb uh, vehicle for what we required. With the car ticking every box, Graham bid for it and won. Delighted, Graham told his grandchildren the holiday was on. Eldest grandson was, was over the moon because uh, he was looking forward to going, going on the beach uh, with nan and granddad. Not long after, Graham's son drove him to the seller's house to pick up the car. 
Graham paid £2,470 in cash on the day and set off in his new Kia Sedona for home. But things soon started to go wrong. It was only about approximately five miles away and I suddenly realised that uh, the, the temperature gauge had gone right to the top of the gauge. Uh, so I immediately pulled into a lay-by and uh, by this time I was panicking obviously and the alarm bells were going that the, uh, the car that had been sold was a problem car and that the first thing that comes into your mind is I just want, don't want this vehicle, I don't want it, you know, it's obviously a problem car, I've, I've only driven five miles away and, and, and it's broken down. Convinced he'd been sold a wrong one, Graham left the Kia in the lay-by and got his son to drive him back to the seller's house. Mr Brassington wasn't there. Instead, he sent a relative to deal with Graham. Mr Brassington's son arrived probably ten minutes later and when I said that, you know, I just didn't want the vehicle, just wanted my money back and uh, he could collect the vehicle from the hard shoulder. His uh, words to me was, that's not an option. You bought the car, the car's yours. Mr Brassington's son did agree to go and look at the car in the lay-by. When we got to the vehicle, he had a quick look at it and said, oh, the water's empty, which obviously it didn't take a genius to work out. He just attempted to turn the engine over and said, oh, well, you look here, it's not, uh, it's not seized. Uh, because they have had uh, experience before and uh, of, uh, in a similar situation and, and the engine sees in. So you're very lucky. And so I said, oh, I'm very lucky. <laughs> oh, right. And uh, he said, well, the, the, the chance of you getting your, your money back is nil, so don't even think about that. The son agreed to take the vehicle home and assess the damage. With night falling, Graham had no choice but to agree. The next day, Mr Brassington ran Graham and offered to get quotes for fixing the car. Graham waited for them, but nothing came. He was left with no car and £2,470 out of pocket. From that day to this day, I've not had any reply from Mr Brassington to me. Several messages on his mobile phone, on his home phone, all from my recorded letters sent to him, uh, you know, over a period of a couple of months. With negotiations going nowhere, Graham had no choice but to take the matter to court. Mr Brassington didn't contest the claim, and the court awarded in Graham's favour. The strain of going to court, however, has taken its toll on Graham. It never leaves your mind. You lie in bed at night thinking of it constantly, You're thinking how they got drawn into this. Why can there be people that won't even speak to you, won't even to come to some compromise? Despite having the law on his side, Graham still not received any payment from Mr Brassington. With nowhere left to turn, he's been forced to hire the sheriffs. Saddling up to try and get Graham his money back are Sheriffs Lawrence and Kev. They're in the snowy north on the trail of Jonathan Brassington. We're in Derbyshire at the moment on our way to um, what looks like a residential address. One individual has sued another, and we're looking to collect £3,696.74. Arriving at the address, they tread carefully. And at the front door, there's a reception committee waiting. Hello there. Looking for uh, Mr Jonathan Brassington. The woman answering is Mr Brassington's wife. She says he won't be back until the evening. Hi, it's Mr Griggs. I'm the enforcement officer. I'm here today to execute a High Court writ against Mr Brassington. Are you able to get him on the phone at all? And then I can explain it to him, and if, if he's happy for me to discuss it with you, then I can discuss it with you. Mrs Brassington wastes no time getting her husband on the phone to talk to Lawrence. Hello there, sir. Right, my name's Mr Griggs, I'm an enforcement officer. I'm here today to execute a High Court writ on behalf of a Graham Millwood. I'm here today for the sum of £3,696.74. pence. we have been ordered here to, um, today to seize goods or collect payment in full. Mr Brassington isn't keen to pay, but admits he has seen the court papers. When you say you sent the county court papers back, what did you send back? 
Right, well, unfortunately, sir, he's got judgment against you. Well, you had the, you had the paperwork from the court, didn't you? Because you returned it. Mr Brassington still doesn't want to pay and now claims he doesn't know about the court award. But Lawrence isn't going to let him get away with that. Because you've just told me you had the court papers and sent them back. Yeah, so you do know about it then, sir. We're here today to execute a High Court writ. What you need to do to prevent any further action is, is pay this in full today. Still unwilling to pay up, Mr Brassington asks to be passed back to his wife. Right, she, she shut the door. I have to give it another knock. I don't think she wants to come to the door again, sir. But Mrs Brassington no longer wants to talk to Lawrence. All he wants to do is give her back her phone. If you want to open the door, Mrs Brassington, I'll give you your phone because your husband wants to speak to you. No. I'll try calling out to her saying, come and get your phone. But... There's somebody called Dom trying to get you uh, on the phone, Mrs Brassington. Unable to get any further communication from the Brassingtons, Lawrence takes a look around the property for other assets he could seize as part of a walking possession. However, there's not much on offer. Don't leave paperwork. He's obviously not going to let us in. So, I've not got no option really other than to leave paperwork. I've seized the bits I can seize, like the car. Time for one more go at returning the phone. Pass it through the cat flap, Kev. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Mrs Brassington, we're putting your phone through the cat flap. It's through the cat flap. With no one willing to communicate with them, there will be no payment today. But it's by no means the end of the story for the sheriffs. There were no goods really worth seizing on the outside of the house and we clearly weren't going to get in. Mrs Brassington appeared to be quite panicked and just shut the door. And, you know, wouldn't even speak through the door. She just... no further communication at all. For the time being, Graham Millward will have to wait to get his money back. But he can be sure the sheriffs will be doing everything in their powers to get him what he's owed. <laughs> 6am, and this time Sheriff Kev is joined by Mark Newton. They are on their way to the East Midlands for an early morning rendezvous with a builder who owes an elderly lady thousands. Yeah, we are in Northamptonshire. Um, come to visit Mr Fitzgerald, who we've been to before. The Fitzgerald case is a classic example of the sheriffs not giving up in their battle to get their clients the money they are owed. The elderly lady the sheriffs are trying to help is 86-year-old Hilda Shaw. Previously in the series, we saw how she turned to the sheriffs after paying thousands for shoddy and unnecessary building work by builder Alan Fitzgerald. I was absolutely shattered. I was crying. I couldn't leave her because I realised, well, you know, the mess I was getting into and I couldn't say stop. He told Hilda her roof was in a state of disrepair and asked for £4,000 to fix it. Luckily, Hilda's son, Terry, found out and stopped him, but not before she'd handed over the money. I checked the guttering, and the guttering the water, was running the opposite direction. You know, you put a spirit level on it, and it ran the opposite way. You can't get the guttering wrong. Got on the phone and, and tried to get him off the property. Jetted down the phone, just get off the property. Get off and leave what you're doing now and get off the property. I went absolutely mental. <laughs> Alan Fitzgerald got an early morning wake-up when the sheriffs paid him a visit with a High Court writ in tow. Hello? He agreed to pay Hilda back the money he owed her. How much is it for? £6,636. £6,000? Hmm. Yeah. You sure it's me? Yeah, Alan Fitzgerald, A to Z Builders. Alan Fitzgerald's men didn't give the sheriffs a fond farewell. I will back that truck straight through your windscreen. No worries, all right. But they were in no position to argue with the orders of the High Court. Alan Fitzgerald paid an £800 down payment and promised £250 a week until the debt cleared. I was very pleased. I could hardly believe it. 
it made me feel there was hope. Where I'd felt so down is if I wasn't going to see any of my money anymore. But since the sheriff's visit, there's been a problem with Alan Fitzgerald's payments. He stopped making them, meaning Hilda is still thousands of pounds short of the money she's owed. With interest and costs, the bill is now over £6,400. But when it comes to builders owing money to senior citizens, the sheriffs take a special interest. Mark and Kev's boss, Peter Watts, has made it his personal mission to see Hilda gets back every penny she's owed. The defendant, as you know, has already defaulted on his next payment. What uh, we're going to do next is regrettably have to reattend and persuade the defendant that um, he's got to address the situation mm -hmm. and refund this money. Encouraged by Peter's resolve, Hilda's looking forward to seeing justice being done. I do hope that if he's gone back on his word, that they really go after him again and make him demand that he should pay. Don't let him escape. Get him by the tail or anything. And on their way to do just that are Mark and Kev. Last time, they managed to get some payment out of Mr Fitzgerald. But how will he react to their demands for the full outstanding amount? Hopefully, he'll be OK with us. He's been all right when he's talked to me on the phone, but obviously he's not paid any money, so I think this time we need to force the issue about getting him to pay. While they never go looking for trouble, sheriffs have to anticipate some people can react badly to their visits. Mark's put the local police on notice that he might need to call them if things kick off. Hopefully there won't be no trouble, but... Um, just judging by last time when the people turned it up, hopefully that won't happen, but if it does, we'll have to deal with that, and if we need the police, we'll give, we'll give them a call. In Mark's job, angry debtors are an occupational hazard. Quite a few times I've been hit, different things, different... I've been hit by someone with a spade once before. Um, I've been punched countless times. Um, it's just part of the job, unfortunately. The sheriffs have arrived at the house. The plan? To give Alan Fitzgerald a second early morning wake-up call. He could be uh, in stealth, Disgrace. stealth mode. But today, there's no sign of anyone being home. The blinds were undone last time, weren't they, as well? The strange there's no dogs, unless they Unless they're out with them. Theories abound as to where Alan Fitzgerald is. I think he is quite a heavy sleeper. Because last time it took us like ten minutes to get an answer and the dogs were barking and everything, so... The sheriffs park up and wait. Oh, look, we're here, so we're not going to get anywhere quick from here, so... We might as well at least wait, you know, we've made the effort to come here. Wait till the sun comes up and then... Uh... The indications are that he's away for the night. Suddenly, a young man appears, who seems to know Alan Fitzgerald. The man says the builder's gone to Hartlepool, but should be back later in the week. He doesn't half look like him, doesn't he? That guy looks like him. Yeah, he looks like he could be his son. With Alan Fitzgerald away, Mark uses his powers as a High Court Enforcement Officer to issue a paper seizure on what assets he can see. I'm just getting the vehicle registered, just, just going to list them on an inventory and then pop it through his door so he sees the two vehicles. Um, just so we know that we've got something while we're here today. The sheriff set off for home. But then, there's another twist in this case. Out of the blue, a call comes through from Alan Fitzgerald. It is, yeah. Sorry, mate, I was just, I was just driving. No payment's been made. Alan Fitzgerald says he offered £4,000 as final settlement by email, but never heard back from the office. Well, I'm not there no more, so what, when, when are you back? Right, I'll, I'll speak to my office. You offered the four grand as, as a final balance. Right, OK, I'll, I'll let them know you've said that. What I would do is I'll get them to send you an email. I'll speak to my office when it opens, 
and I'll give you a ring back. No problem. All right, cheers, Alan. All right, bye-bye. £4,000 is better than nothing, but it's still a long way short of the £6,400 that Alan Fitzgerald owes Hilda and the sheriffs. Basically, what he's wanting to do is pay four grand, and that's it. All right, but it's obviously more than that now. But it's more than that. The thing is, he's not hiding, is he? Don't run away, no. this is what's happening. No, he's, not, he's not avoiding us at all. There's no, no need for him to no. bring us in. He's got straight on the phone, hasn't he? And that's all with it. That is his son. Yeah, uh, that what he said? Yeah, he said, the boy's just wrong with me. He said, Dad, you've got these people outside your house. Mark believes Alan Fitzgerald is serious about paying, even if he doesn't want to pay the full amount. He's not denied a job. He said he's found out what the job's about now, and he said that, that it's one of the other traveller fellas, is the way he worded it. Um, and he's, he's willing to pay it £2,000 of it, the other guy, and Alan will pay the other £2,000. That's what they're saying. Um, I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of the job, unfortunately. All I know is that I've got a bet for £6,000. £6,400, and he's only offering £4,000, so um, he might need to at least start paying. If he started paying, we wouldn't have been back here, I don't think, today, so we'll see if we can get some, to pay some money back. There's nothing more Mark and Kev can do today. Hilda's still waiting for her money, but one thing's for sure. The sheriffs are absolutely determined she'll get the payment she's owed in good time and in full. Mr Fitzgerald denies carrying out unnecessary work. He says he thought Hilda Shaw was happy with the job he was doing and that the only reason it wasn't completed was because Hilda's son asked him to stop. However, he has agreed to pay Hilda in full and has since initiated payment to her. Another person who's had to call on the help of the sheriffs after buying a faulty second-hand car is Gregory Benjamin. He needs a 4x4 to help transport his disabled mother-in-law. You all right there? The car he used to own no longer fitted the bill. I had a three-door Focus before, but that wasn't big enough to get my mother-in-law, Connie, in and her walking frame when we took her out or go shopping. So I wanted something a bit bigger. When we looked around, we found what appeared to be a reputable dealer that specialised in the one we liked, which was a Mitsubishi Pajero. Keen to test drive the car, Gregory went up to the dealership to look at it. Externally, it seemed adequate for what we were going to do. Uh, it was quite old, but the price seemed reasonable for the condition that he was claiming the vehicle was in. We took it for a test drive. It seemed to work OK when we drove around the industrial estate. Loving the Pajero, Gregory gladly handed over £1,300 for it. Once I bought the car, I was quite pleased with it, and uh, it seemed just the job to fulfil the purposes that we required. Um, it was big, it was shiny, it was a four-wheel drive. It was just what you want. But it wasn't long before things started going wrong. When we were driving back, there was, it, the car started to smell a little bit from inside and the, the temperature gauge was starting to rise quite rapidly. Um, when I pulled over, it was, you could clearly see there was steam coming out of it and water had ingressed into the oil cooling system. Angry at what had happened, Gregory tried to get back in touch with the seller, Dean Rosenthal. I rung him up and he said he'd come down and pick it up and repair it for us the next day. But he never turned up. I rung him again. He said he'd come down later in the week and he didn't. I rung him up again and asked him to come and repair it or I would be forced to take legal action against him. He said, you can do that, but it'll take several months and you won't get your money back and you still won't get the vehicle repaired. And I inferred from that that he had no intention of repairing the vehicle. With no other avenues open to him, Gregory was forced to go through with his threat and take Mr Rosenthal to court. His case wasn't contested by the dealer and the court awarded in Gregory's favour. But despite this, Mr Rosenthal has continued to avoid paying.
with nowhere left to turn, the only person that can help Gregory now is Sheriff Pete Spencer. He's on his way to Manchester to try and track down Mr. Rosenthal. We're going to visit the home address or the address that we've got at the moment. I believe some letters have been sent out there previously and they've been sent back not known at this address, but uh, you know, he's, he's, he's registered at this particular address we're visiting, so hopefully he'll be there this morning. Pete gets to the address on the writ. But the bad news is, Mr. Rosenthal isn't there. In fact, it appears he's long gone from this house. It's empty as a property, there's nothing inside at all. Nothing for Pete to seize here, but he's as tenacious as a sheriff gets. Pete finds a second address for Mr. Rosenthal, this time at a commercial premises. His detective work on the phone proves highly illuminating. The guy he seems to be never there. We spoke to the, the people next door in the next door unit and they said he's very rarely there. He's away buying and selling vehicles all the time. Um, and it's very amiss if he's going to be there. So hopefully today we'll, we'll get there. If he's there, brilliant. If he's not there, we'll try and get him on the phone and, uh, and hopefully he'll come down. Pete's search for the elusive Mr. Rosenthal continues. But when he arrives at the commercial address, his fears are soon realised. Dean Rosenthal's not here either. But, on the plus side, some of his property is. This uh, unit here, there's two roll shutters and the, the metal door behind us. Um, one lad has confirmed there is items in there. Pete will seize the items if Dean Rosenthal doesn't pay what he owes. And the moment of truth has arrived. Pete's phone research again pays dividends. He's managed to track down the man himself. I need to collect 333201. Okay, or else I've, I've got a locksmith on standby and police on standby to break in and seize whatever goods are inside. Yep, I know, I know, and we've, we've got a, a low loader um, on standby to, to come and collect eight, eight vehicles plus a transporter to recover the cost. Mr. Rosenthal doubts Pete's threats, but he's deadly serious. All sheriffs have the power to enter commercial properties using force if necessary. I've got a warrant to break in today. That's why the police, are, the next person for me to ring is a police, a locksmith, and the low loaders to, to come and uh, get the items out and the, they go off to storage for five days and get sold on the fifth day auction. So instead of just messing us around, just, just get yourself down there so we can deal with it. That's the best way to do it. Pete's strategy seems to be working. Within minutes, Mr. Rosenthal arrives in his own Pajero. At this point, our camera operator is asked to leave. The discussions continue behind closed doors. Within minutes, Pete emerges with a bulging envelope. So that's the, the money in full collected today. Obviously, there's a little bit of waiting time put on as well. And the, uh, the total amount collected was £3,548 and one pence. Payment in full, um, Clement will uh, will be getting the money, so uh, a good result. Pete's tenacity has paid off both for him and, more importantly, for Gregory, who can expect a four-figure sum heading his way any day soon. Since the sheriffs met with Green Oak Pharmacy's solicitor, Yasmin and Al-Nasir have been informed of the walking possession agreement on the Range Rover that he signed. Well, that's very good news. At least we have got a result. They've done what nobody else has been able to do. At least it's a beginning. Up until now, nothing had started. So at least something started. So it's the beginning. So we shall keep on fighting. <laughs> Lawrence and Kev have revisited the Brassingtons' house in Derbyshire. They were hoping for more than the chicken feed they got last time, but once again, they failed to lay eyes on Mr. Brassington. They clamped one of the cars to see if it would draw Jonathan Brassington out, but not even that could raise him. So they served papers and left. They're currently investigating the ownership of the vehicles with a view to a third visit. And if they don't get Jonathan Brassington's attention then, they'll seize and tow any cars they can prove he owns. 
It's five weeks since Mark and Kev went to build at Alan Fitzgerald's house. Following that visit, Mr Fitzgerald promised to arrange payment to Hilda. And now, authorised High Court Enforcement Officer Peter Watts is making a special trip to a certain lady, bearing good news. Come in. Thank you. But what I'm very pleased to be able to tell you is that we've actually recovered £4,678.81. Oh, that's wonderful. 81 pence. Oh, dear. Thanks to the sheriffs, Hilda has another happy memory to add to the list. Well, Peter came along with this wonderful check to bring this awful situation to a close. It's absolutely wonderful. One hundred years after it sank, Titanic lives on with personal stories from the relatives of those who died. Len Goodman explores the legacy left behind with a new series.